Hello everyone, my name is Zaid Taha and I'm a PhD student here at the University of Ottawa and the Ottawa Hospital. I'm also a member of the Diallo Lab and I'm a Let's Talk Science volunteer. The Ottawa Hospital is one of the largest research institutions here in Canada. We're especially interested in discovering new ways of treating our patients and we're always looking for the fastest ways of translating these new methods right to the clinic. Allow me to introduce you to my colleagues. I'm Kira Sutherland, a master's student here at the Cancer Centre and a member of the Diallo Lab. I'm Taylor Jamison Datsky. I'm an MD PhD student in the Bell and Ilko Labs. Hi, my name is Abira Surendran, and I'm a PhD student here at the Ilko and Bell Labs at the Cancer Center. Here at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, our teams operate as part of a large multidisciplinary group. Our research focuses on all sorts of things, including regenerative medicine, stem cells, neuroscience, immunology, and cancer research. Our group is especially interested in cancer research and more specifically, cancer killing viruses, which we call oncolytic viruses. So if we head into the lab now, we can show you how these viruses are made, how they work, we can tell you a little bit more about them. What's special about oncolytic viruses is that they're specifically engineered so that they're weakened or attenuated is what we call this. This means that genetic changes are made so that these viruses cannot infect normal cells, but can only infect cancer cells. Upon infection, these viruses can combat cancer in a number of different ways. First, these viruses will rupture the cells that they infect, which will ultimately lead to the destruction of the tumor that they're in. We call this lysis. Very importantly, this infection causes inflammation, like any other sort of infection, and that immediately attracts the immune system to the site and will allow it to join the fight against the tumor. Very interestingly, we can also add in or encode specific genes into these viruses that can make them even better at combating cancer. Similarly, we can encode genes that can help us track the virus. For example, by making it light up a specific color. All right, so we're gonna go see Kira, who is our genetic engineering specialist, because I wanna ask her to make me a specific green glowing virus. All right, follow me. Hey, Kira. How's it going? I was wondering if you could make me a GFP virus today, please and thank you. Thank you. In this tube, I have viral DNA, all the instructions to make a virus. It's in a circular form known as a plasmid. Using molecular biology techniques, I am able to cut open this circular DNA and make space for new genes. We call these transgenes. They can be a plethora of other proteins. For Zaid's purposes, he needs a virus that can glow green. We can do this using green fluorescent protein, or GFP. This sequence will give the instructions to make that. Using other molecular biology techniques, we can glue them back together. This makes a new plasmid with our new sequence alongside the instructions to make a virus. It will produce a virus that, when it infects cells, causes them to glow green. As you know, you can't see DNA with your naked eye, so we have many different techniques to help us visualize it. One of these techniques I'll show you today. It's called an agro shell. It's this gel sitting right in this liquid. In the gel is a special dye that when we load DNA into it, we can put it under a UV light and actually see the DNA glow. Oh no. <laughs> So I'm able to load DNA into it using a pipette. Now that the DNA is in it, we run an electric current through it using these wires and this box. And what it's going to do is it's going to pull the DNA along the gel. DNA that's bigger makes it heavier, so it goes slow. And then DNA that's shorter is lighter and it travels faster. This way we're able to separate DNA based on its size. Once it runs, we're able to put it on this special UV light box here. Using this UV light, we can now see this thick bar here glowing. That's the plasmid we've made, so it looks like it's worked. Now that we've successfully made our plasmid and the instructions to make the virus, we have to turn it into an actual virus. We do this using live tissue culture. Follow me, I'll show you what I mean. Abera is in TC right now and will be able to make the virus for me. Hey Abera, would you be able to turn this plasmid into a virus? Of course. Thank you. Thanks. So 
now we will use the DNA that Kiera provided us that has the specific instructions to make our virus of interest. But to make our virus, we'll also need to include the DNA of other viral structural proteins. To make our virus, we use a certain type of cells called Vero cells. These are green uh, African monkey cells that are readily infectable. So first, we will include all of the DNA pieces to make our virus from all three tubes. Once we've added all the pieces of DNA, we'll need to provide the cell some time to make the virus of interest. And this takes about a day at least. But luckily for us, we did a similar experiment yesterday and we can take a look at those. Now to visualize our virus, we need to walk over to a special microscope that has a filter that allows us to see the GFP or green fluorescent protein that Zayd and uh, Kira have cloned in. Let's go take a look. To take a look at our GFP or green fluorescent protein expressing virus, we'll need to use a microscope that has a special filter to allow us to see it. Now, before we get started, we want to make sure that our viral cells that we use to make our virus are healthy. This is an uninfected well, and you can see a nice, clean monolayer of all the viral cells. Now, let's take a look at our infected well. We'll need to use that special green filter. Well, it looks like in this well, we didn't get our virus of interest, but that's okay, it happens in science sometimes. Let's look at a different well. Maybe we had better luck there. Lots of GFP. You can see that a lot of these cells are starting to round up and die because they're being infected by the virus. This will be more visible in the bright field where these cells are clearly patching and are rounding up and are being killed by the virus. So now that we've made our, designed our virus, made our virus, we need to expand our stocks to do future experiments. And to do that, we grow up these Vero cells in large numbers in something called roller bottles. Let me show you where that is. These roller bottles contain millions and millions of the same Vero cells we have in our plate. We use these roller bottles for large scale production of virus such as clinical grade virus products that are used in clinical trials. And we do that here at the OHRI. In those productions, we make as many as 40 of these roller bottles in one batch. Now, these roller bottles have as much cell debris as I've shown you in the microscope, and you can administer that to patients. You'll need to purify your virus. And to do that, we use something called an ultra centrifuge that allows us to pellet all of our virus into a pure product. My colleague Taylor will show us just how that works. Follow me. Thank you, Abira. Here we have an ultra centrifuge that we can use to spin down our virus from this very large volume to this very small concentrated stock. This can spin our virus down at speeds of over 100,000 times G. Once we have our purified stock of virus, it's important to know exactly how much virus we have. So you can follow me. When we compare viruses head to head, it's important to know exactly how many viral particles are in each sample. That way we can compare them against each other and make a fair comparison. So what I'm doing here is called a plaque assay. The first thing I need to do is infect the cells that I have on this plate with a little bit of the virus that we have made. Next, I'll leave the plate in the incubator for a couple of days. As the cells start to die off from infection, there will be small holes that form in the layer of cells on the plate. I can use a stain called crystal violet to stain the plate and visualize the holes very easily to count the number of viral particles that were there. Once I'm finished, 
it will look like this plate here that I stained earlier today. Now that we've quantified our virus, Kira can take it for cryopreservation. Thanks, Taylor. Follow me to the cryopreservation. Now that we have the virus quantified, we can store it in some of our high-tech freezers. This one goes all the way down to negative 80. We keep a lot of virus in here. But for long-term storage, we can go even colder. We do this by using liquid nitrogen. It goes all the way down to negative 180 degrees, so I have to make sure I'm well protected. We don't need to store this now though because Zade needs the virus right away. So let's go find him. All right, so to sum things up real quick. First, I asked Kira to make me a green glowing virus. And she went ahead and she engineered that for me. Next, she took that and she gave it to Ibira who went ahead and grew that up for us and verified that the virus is actually the correct virus because she saw it glowing green. Finally, she gave that grown up virus to Taylor, who purified it, and then she was also able to tell us exactly how much virus is in there. Now that I have this virus, I can go ahead and test it out in many different ways. So for example, I can test it out on cells and see how well it kills them. Also, you can see here, this is one of our many robotics that we have in this facility. We can go ahead and test out the virus on multiple different cells with a combination of multiple different drugs in a really short amount of time. And you can kind of see it's, it's very efficient. And lastly, when we have an idea of just how good this virus is, we can finally make preparations to be able to use it in actual patients. Thanks everyone for joining us for a day in the life of a scientist here at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. We hope you learned a few cool things about oncolytic viruses. Thanks for tuning in.